Hello, everyone. How are you doing today? Thank you for your patience uh, with the bishop's desk. Um, we want to go right into the word of God. Back to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2. I'm going to try to finish up Hebrews chapter 2 today, if I can. And uh, we move on to chapter 3. But we finished in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, where we left off, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord God, for this day, for this time, for allowing us, dear God, to sit at the master's table and to hear and to eat. God, we ask you to open up our ears, dear God, that we may, Lord God, be able to understand the word, dear God. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. But we see Jesus, he says, who was also made a little lower than the angels. Man was also made a little lower than the angels. Uh, man was actually also, man actually was also, was actually made before Jesus in the flesh because Jesus was in the father. And so, he also was made a little lower than the angels, just like man, uh, for the suffering of death. Crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Christ has tasted death for every man. And as we go on into uh, verse 10, it says, for it became him. For whom are all things, and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For it became him, uh, the Lord Jesus. He took he took on. He took on. He he conditioned himself. He he allowed himself to to. allowed suffering and to taste death for every man. He allowed it to become him. In other words, it, 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 it superseded all things. The ultimate reasoning was to taste death for man. And, and before he tastes death, he performed miracles along the way in between to convince man that he was the Messiah. But ultimately, it was about dying and suffering for man. It became him. It, 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 it took over his life. It was the most important reason it became him. And we must become children of God, followers. It must become us to suffer in our flesh. Why? Because we, we, we learn in 1 Peter 4, we learn for as much then, four and one, for as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise. In other words, Peter says, it must become you. For it became, it became him, Christ. It must become us. What must become us? That we must arm ourselves likewise with the same mind that Christ had that we must suffer in the flesh because for us, for Christ suffering in the flesh, it made him the captain of our salvation. For you and I to suffer in the flesh, we cease from sin. The, 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 the scripture wouldn't apply to Christ the same way it applied to us in Peter, because Christ knew no sin. There was no sin found in him. 
while being in the flesh. This is why the scripture would speak, it speaks different to us. In Hebrews chapter, chapter two and 10, it says, for it became him for whom all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. So for Christ, his suffering made us perfect and it made him the captain of our salvation through his suffering. For us to arm ourselves likewise to suffer in the flesh, we cease from sin. So two things are happening here. For Christ, he becomes the, he becomes the captain through suffering. For us, we cease from our flesh, the suffering of our flesh, which brings on sin through suffering. For it became, it was suitable to divine wisdom and justice and the program of grace to offer Jesus as a sacrifice in order to bring many sons to glory. It was divine wisdom. It was God's plan that it would become Christ. Why? Because all things are for whom are all things and by whom are all things. Everything that is are from God and they belong to God. This is what this is saying here. And, 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 and Christ used those things, those things that we, 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 that, that causes us to suffer in our flesh. Christ used those things to prove to us that he came for us to suffer for us in those things that was created by him for him, for his use, that he would get the glory and that he would become the captain of our salvation through those things that he suffered through for you and I. And as he suffered, what did he do? He brought sons and daughters unto glory. Christ brought you here to this place, this place of glory for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call us brethren. I believe we, we went over that last week. Yes, we did. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praises unto thee. Verse 12, saying, I will, I will. He's going to give us his name. Let's look at declare. He said, I will declare. Declare. Say something in a solemn or emphatic manner. Acknowledge, possession of. He said, I will give, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. Say something in a solemn or emphatic manner. He put an emphasis on it, that he's gonna give his name unto his brethren. See, he, after his suffering, he calls us his brothers. 
He said he would give us his name in the midst of the church. Will I sing praises unto thee? This is a this is a prophecy fulfilled here. So let's go to um Psalms. 22 Psalms 22 Psalms 22 let's see what this says Psalms 22 25 Psalms 22 and 22 I will declare thy name see this has already been said by the chief musician Shaphar a psalm of David He said here, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I sing praise. This is what David said. But let's go back up a little further in Psalms, in Psalms 22. Let's go back to, um, let's go back to let's go back to eight. Let's just go back to eight. He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighteth in him. Be, but thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me around. They gaped upon me with their mouths. They gaped upon me with their mouths and a raving and a rock as a raving and roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bios. My strength is dried up like a pot shred and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou has brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. They assemb the, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. But be not thou far from me, O Lord. O my strength, has thou, has thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling, from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth. For thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, will I praise thee? It reads here, when you read here, it reads like a, 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 a Christ here. Because we know that when Christ was on the cross, excuse me, we know that when Christ was on the cross, that his tongue cleaved to his mouth. My strength is dried up like the pot shred and my tongue cleaveth to the jaws. The dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. This is the crucifixion of Christ here because Christ was the only one that has been pierced 
in his hands and his feet while they nailed him to the cross. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. And we do know that in verse 18, they part my garments among them and they cast lots upon my vestry. We know that they took Christ's garments and they cast lots for it. But he says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. Christ said that he would declare his name unto his brethren in the midst of the congregation. Well, I praise thee. And so we see the, the prophecy here that had been spoken in Psalms 22, a Psalm of David, that here in Hebrews 2 and 12, he says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praises. We know that Christ is the one that sanctifieth and we know that we are the sanctified because it was Christ who sanctified us Christ the great sanctifier who sets apart this is what this is what Christ this is what Christ did for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified. We are all one. But Christ is the sanctifier. Verse 11 says. Christ is the sanctifier. He's the one. Christ is the one through his suffering. That has set us apart. Through his suffering he has consecrated us. To the service of God. This is why Peter says to arm yourselves likewise, because in that Christ died, the sanctifier Christ, he has sanctified us and has consecrated us to a service unto God. So if your life and your day-to-day -day actions do not, consists of anything that is service unto God, then you're walking out of your vocation. Because in your vocation, you have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Hear me, in your vocation, you have been given through Christ's suffering, your ministry of reconciliation. We learn that in, 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 in 2 Corinthians that we have been given this ministry of reconciliation. Christ has sanctified you. He is the sanctifier. He has sanctified you for the purpose. He has consecrated you for the purpose to the service of God. They who are sanctified or thus consecrated and set apart to the service of God, we are all of one. And this is why he says, I will declare thy name unto my brother. And this is why you are no longer called a servant, but a brother, because he has made you a brother. Through sanctification and his suffering. Amen. And he said he will give you his name. Um, let's see. Uh, it's four and twelve. Let me see. 
He said, I will declare, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church while I sing pra praises. Um, he said he'll give us his name. Uh, he'll declare his name unto his brother in the midst of the church. Will I sing praises unto thee? Acts 4, Acts 4. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Neither, verse 12, 4, Acts 4 and 12, neither is there salvation in any other. <laughs> Go to Acts 4 and 12. As you see, look, as you study, right, it's good to have, see, I use my cell phone because as I study and as the, 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 sometimes the, the, the scripture, I may not know where it is right offhand, but it'll come to my spirit. And so I'll, I'll type in, um, a few of the words and it'll take me there. Um, because as I read, as I read, um, Hebrews 2 and 12 saying, I will declare by name unto my brethren. So I'm thinking about, as I'm reading that, I'm thinking about the name I will declare. He emphatically said, made a declaration that he would give us, he solemnly said this, that he would give us his name. So I begin to think about his name and then I, and then I begin to think about the scripture, uh, Acts 4 and 12, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no, for there is none other name. He said he was given to us. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Name of Jesus. He gave us his name. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they looked and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. But here they 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 told these they 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 spoke and said, neither is there salvation in any other. This is Confirmation also, verse 10, for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons, listen, bringing many sons unto glory to make them, to make the captain of their salvation. Then they says, in Acts, neither is there salvation in any other. Why? There is no salvation in any other because there's only one captain and that is Jesus. Acts 4 and 12, neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And that name is the name of Jesus Christ, Christ, Savior. And Jesus said, he said, I will declare thy name. He's the only one that can declare his name. No other can declare the name of Jesus and give you the name of Jesus except Jesus. That would be trademark infringement if somebody else would try to come and give you Jesus' name. Jesus gave his name to us. Nobody else had the power to declare his name but him. He earned the right to be called Jesus, the son of God, through his suffering. And, and, and his name earned the right and the respect 
to be the only name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. He earned that, his name, he earned that through his suffering, becoming the captain of our salvation. He said, I'll give you my names in, in the midst of the church while I sing praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God have given me. That's verse 13 in Hebrews. Back to Hebrews, Hebrews from Acts 4. And again, I will, God says, I will. Put my trust in him. And again, behold. I and the children which God have given me. Because of Christ's conquest of death and hell and deliverance of righteous souls from captivity. Let's go to Ephesians 4, 7 through 11. Let's look at that. Ephesians 4. Okay. Ephesians 4. Verse seven, what does that say? But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Okay. Remember. Again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children which God have given me. Okay, we've been given to Christ. But unto every one of us that have been given to Christ is grace, is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Okay, so because we belong to Christ, it is Christ who is giving us this grace because we belong to Christ. And Christ is giving us this grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. In other words, the gift of Christ is not, look, the gift is not of him, is not limited to man, but the gift of Christ is given unto man according to his own measure. In other words, the more of Christ that you want, the more Christ will give you of himself. The more you desire, the more you draw nigh unto Christ, the more he will draw nigh unto you. So in other words, you kind of control the measure of Christ that's in you. But it's infinite. It's available. He said, but unto every one of us is grace given according. So you're not going to get the same grace that I get. And I'm not going to get the same grace that you get. I'm going to get the, uh, I'm going to get the amount of grace, which is the gift of Christ according to the measure of my sacrifice unto Christ. So if you want to be strong in the power of his might, 
and and to and to have that scripture not only just come out of your mouth, but to have that scripture be true to your life, then you're going to have to sacrifice back to Peter, back to Peter, arming yourself likewise to suffer in the flesh. He who have suffered in the flesh, he have ceased from sin. And when he ceased from sin, the grace of God, which is the gift of Christ, will be given unto you more. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. You want the gifts that come with Christ because the gifts from God are all in Christ. You want the gifts from Christ? You're going to have to give yourself more to Christ. Now that he ascended up, it is but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth, which means he died. To descend in the lower parts of the earth mean Christ died before he was ascended, before he was, this is confirmation that Christ rose from the grave and that he went into the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. This is confirmation. He that descended is the same also that ascended. Up from above all heavens, he went back to God. He was glorified that he might fill all things. And after he completed His mission here on earth, he went back above the heavens that he might fill all things. All things what? All things pertaining to God the Father. Whatever that conversation was between him and the Father, he went above the heavens to fill those things, to please the Father to satisfy God, to become, to become the captain of our salvation. He was given his stamp of approval from God. And then he gave some, not all. A lot of people, a lot of people claiming a lot of things. But the Bible say he gave some <laughs> apostles and some, not all, prophets and some, not all, evangelists and some, not all, pastors and teachers. Why? Because everybody can't do it. Somebody got to listen. But the reason but the reason was not that we should gloat or hold ourselves in a higher place above man, but that we would that we would glorify Christ for the perfecting of the saints. Yeah. Not that you would not that you would hold me in such a such a high place that you can't see Jesus. See, this is the problem with a lot of people. A lot of people hold prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers in a place so high that people can't see Christ. 
because all they can see is the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. And they and 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 and, and these play and these people who God who Christ gave these gifts to, sometimes they walk around like they Christ themselves. And the people never see. But that's not why he gave us the gift to puff ourselves up. But he gave us these gifts for the perfecting. So that they would see Christ and not us. Of the saints. So that we can help the people see Christ. And not the evangelist. To see Christ and not the pastor. To see Christ and not the teacher. And to see Christ and not the prophets. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. Because there again, we go into Hebrews 4 where it talks about that Christ rest remaineth because some have not yet entered in. And this is why he sent these gifts to some for the edifying, to teach the body of Christ. Until we all come in the unity of the faith. Until some enter in. And of the knowledge of the son of God. Unto a perfect man. Unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 4, 13. Let me see, let me see, let me see. I'm going to my study Bible. I just want to see what my study Bible has to say about Ephesians 4. Let me see. The pages are all stuck together. Ephesians 4 and 13. Bear with me right here. Ephesians 2, 3, 4, 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, a perfect man, Unto the measure of Christ, the fullness of Christ, M, perfect man. Let me see what that says. Perfect man. M, Ephesians 4, being fulfilled, teleos, fulfilled. That's the Greek teleos, T-E-L-E-I-O-S. That means to be filled, that which has reached maturity, okay, okay, until we all come in the unity of the faith, of the knowledge, perfect man, maturity, okay, until, until we reach the level of maturity, he's saying, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, I would assume that's the knowledge, let me see, um, perfection, Greek knowledge, paloma. Let me see what that means. Bear with me. Bear with me. Bear with me. P. If you if you have your 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 Greek thesaurus or or put P L E. Aura, O, M, A. Let me see if I can get the pronunciation. Pleroma. Aroma. Aroma. Pleroma. Aroma. Pleroma. In Gnosticism, we know what that is. Gnosticism is a private interpretation of one... Um, teaching of the word of God. And we know that there is no um, um, Gnosticism that that God permits because there's no private interpretation of the word. 
and Gnosticism, the spiritual universe, as the abode of God and of the totality of the divine power and emanations. In Christian theology, the totality or fullness of the Godhead, which dwells in Christ. Okay, we want the second of the two because we know that Paul wrote to, I can't remember, is it the Galatian church? It might be the Galatian church where Gnosticism was, um, was taken prevalent. Um, but it was one of the letters that Paul wrote and he was addressing Gnosticism, that private interpretation uh, about the universe, um, 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 evolution and all that stuff, right? All that's tied together. But in the Christian theology, the totality or fullness of the Godhead, which dwells in Christ. Okay, so so we see in. Ephesians 4, till we come into the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, a mature man, until we all mature unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, the Godhead that dwells in Christ, okay? So that's what this, so that's what 4 and 13 is talking about until we come into the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the son of God, unto, unto a mature man, a perfect man, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, until we come into that knowledge, until we come into a, a mature man to understand the fullness of the Godhead which dwells in Christ, because as long as we're in this tabernacle, we're yet learning and we have not yet came into the fullness of the Godhead. We're forever learning. But it all dwells in Christ and it's being revealed to us and we're seeking this diligently, the Bible tells us. And so, and all of this comes from Hebrews. That, all of that pulls us from Hebrews 12. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children of God, which God have given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had power of power of death, that is the devil. That's self-explanatory. It said Christ, for as much then as children are partakers, we are partakers of the flesh and blood. He himself put himself in a body of flesh to take part of the same, to take part of our same struggles. The same struggles that we struggle with, the same fight that we fight against Satan, Christ came and, and fought the same fight. He fought it all the way to the end. He fought a good fight. That through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Christ had to die to take the power out of death. It took him to die to defeat death. Uh, I hate to use this analogy, but it was the analogy that came to me and and and. But, you know, it's the truth. Like if you have a hangover, I guess y'all might be saying, well, what are you talking about that? I mean, hey, it's the truth. I can only talk about what I know. If you have a hangover, they tell you 
drink another drink in the morning and it'll move the hangover. And that's true. When you wake up in the morning from drinking alcohol all night long and you're sick, if you take another drink in the morning, it'll kind of subside the hangover. Because basically what you're doing is that hangover is that bad feeling in your body rejecting. Your body is rejecting what you put in it. Hangovers is just basically your body telling you, don't do this no more. This is not, this is not good for you. That's what a hangover is. It's telling you that everything you put in you last night was not good. Don't do it no more. But at the time you was putting the, 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 the drink or the alcohol in you, it made you feel good. So when you wake up with the hangover and then you put another drink on top of the hangover, it takes the hangover away and it makes you feel okay again. But sometimes it won't take it all the way away, but you'll feel okay. You'll start not feeling as bad and then you get drunk again, and then you wake up with a hangover again, it becomes a cycle, then you become an alcoholic. This is how alcoholism and alcoholics are developed. To get rid of the bad feeling, you take another drink, and then it becomes addictive, and then you become an alcoholic. And so to get rid of the bad feeling, you have to take another drink in order, in order to take the power from Satan of death, Christ death. Died. He did what he he did exactly what it is that Satan was controlling us with and keeping us in fear was death. What Christ did was he died, took death from Satan, and got up with all power in his hand. He died. To take the power out of it. Had he not died. Then the power would have still been in death. It would have been the power. Of the power. The fear that comes out of the power. The, forgive me. Death releases. Fear upon people. Which becomes power over people. Which injects fear in people. But Christ is saying. If you are of me, I have died for you and I have taken the power out of death and fearing death because you are now in me because I will live forever. So now the power and the fear that was once in death, it exists no more because Christ who can't die, he died and now he got up because he can't die. Man, y'all better hear me. He died, but he can't die, but he had to die. That's something. He can't die, but he died to conquer death. And when he got up, he took the power that death had against man he took it out of that. That's why we don't fear death, the children of God, all because of Christ. That's why there's no fear in, 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 in us to die no more because of Christ, because we live unto Christ, because we know to be absent from this mind and this body is to be very much present with the Lord. We know that to live is to, 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 to live in Christ. To die in this body, we gain Christ.
Philippians 1, 21. I didn't want to mess it up. That's why I stopped. Because sometimes we, I, I, I speak for myself. Sometimes I'll get the saying scriptures and saying some of the words that ain't in them. But you know what I mean. But I wanted to say this right. Philippians 1 and 20. According to my earnest expectation and my hope. That in nothing I shall be ashamed. But that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, that is the fruit of my labor, yet what I shall choose, I won't not. For I am in a straight betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, having this confidence, having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ, not in the gifts. Not in the gifts that he gave some. He gave some prophets. He gave some apostles. He gave some pastors. He gave some teachers. He gave some evangelists. But not in those gifts that your rejoicing should lie. But your rejoicing should lie in the abundance of Christ Jesus. For me by my coming to you again. Yes, 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 and yes. And deliver them who through the fear of death who were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. Christ went through your pain. He understands you. God bless you. This is the Bishop's Desk. Next week, we will begin Hebrews chapter 3. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. God bless you.